Some may say the colonizers want to move too fast. Let us never forget that it wasn't such a long time ago that the colonized were accused of being too slow, lazy, and fatalistic. The violence channeled into the liberation struggle does not vanish as if by magic after hoisting the national colors. It has even less reason to disappear since nation building continues to operate within the framework of critical competition between capitalism and socialism. This competition gives a quasi-universal dimension to the the most local of disputes. Every meeting, every act of repression reverberates around the inter- international arena. The Sharpeville massacre shook public opinion for months. In the press over the airwaves and in private conversations, Sharpeville has become a symbol. It is through Sharpeville that men and women address the problem of apartheid in South Africa, and there is no reason to believe that demagoguery alone explains the sudden interest by the major powers in the petty affairs of the underdeveloped regions. Every peasant revolt, every insurrection in the third world fits into the framework of the Cold War. In Salisbury, and an entire block goes into action, focuses on these two men, and uses this beat to raise the issue of Rhodesia, linking it to the rest of Africa and every colonized subject. For those who don't know, uh, Rhodesia is was the name of Zimbabwe. Uh, it was a completely white world, and the whites were a minority, obviously. Uh, yeah, that was a super colonial country. Uh, so let's continue. The full-scale campaign underway leads the other block to gauge the flaws in its sphere of influence. The colonized peoples realize that neither faction is interested in disengaging itself from regional conflicts. They no longer limit their horizons to one particular region since they are swept along in this atmosphere of universal convulsion. When every three months we learn that the 6th or 7th U.S. fleet is heading towards some coast or other, when Khrushchev threatens to come to Castro's aid with the help of missiles, when Kennedy envisages drastic solutions for Laos, the colonized or newly independent peoples get the impression they are being forced, whether they like it or not, into a frantic march. In fact, they are already marching. Let us take, for example, the case of governments of recently liberated countries. The men in power spent two-thirds of their time keeping watch over their borders, alerting any threat of danger, and the other third working for the country. At the same time, they are looking for support, governed by the same dialectic. The national opposition gives parliamentary channels the cold shoulder. It seeks allies who agree to support them in their ruthless endeavor at sedition. The atmosphere of violence, after having penetrated the colonial phase, continues to dominate national politics. As we have said, the third world is not excluded. On the contrary, it is at the very center of the convulsion. This is why in their speeches, the statesmen of underdeveloped countries maintain indefinitely a tone of aggressiveness and exasperation, which normally should have disappeared. The often reported impoliteness of the new leaders is understandable. What is less notable noticeable is the extreme courtesy these city leaders show towards their brothers and comrades. Their impolite behavior is first and foremost directed against the others, against the former colonialists, known to observe and investigate. The ex-colonized, too, get the impression 
findings of these investigations are a foregone conclusion. The journalist is on assignment to justify them. The photos that illustrate the article provide proof that he knows what he is talking about and was actually there. The investigation sets out to prove that everything went wrong as soon as we left. The journalists often complain they are badly treated, are forced to work under poor conditions, and go up against a wall of indifference or hostility. All this is quite normal. The nationalist leaders know that the international opinion is forged solely by the Western press. When a Western journalist interviews us, however, it is seldom, seldom done to render us service. In the war in Algeria, for example, the most liberal-minded French reporters make constant use of ambiguous epithets to portray our struggle. When we reproach them for it, they reply in all sincerity that they are being subjective. When we reproach them for it, they reply in all sincerity that they are being objective. For the colonists, object objectivity is always directed against them. Understandable, too, is that, th is that new tone of violence which dominated international diplomacy at the United Nations General Assembly in 9th September 1960. The representatives of the colonial countries were aggressive and violent in the extreme, but their populations found nothing exaggerated. The radicalism of the African spokespersons brought the abscess to a head and shone the spotlight on the unacceptable nature of the veto, on the collusion between major powers, and above all, on the insignificant role allotted the third world. Don is explaining here how victorious, nation victorious nationalist movements in the third world are constantly under the threat, both from within and from without. Western journalists who had helped to create the international media narrative report with a false sense of objectivity. During the colonial period, these same outlets failed to uh, objectively report the brutality of their home countries against their uh, against their colonial subjects, and only now do they report of this violence of the new leaders against their enemies. Mind you that these are the same enemies that are attempting to return the country to the same kind of subjugation that the nationalist movements had just ousted. So it's kind of like, you know, they're either screwed in the media, you know, they're either screwed over in the media or they're going to get screwed over by a right-wing coup to topple their country and, and resubjugate the colonists. The, not the colonists, sorry, resubjugate the colonial subjects who were, who were now liberated. Diplomacy, as initiated by the newly independent peoples, is no longer a matter of nuances, innuendos, and hypnotic passes. Their spokesmen have been assigned by their population to defend both the unity of the nation, the welfare of the masses, as well as the right to freedom and self-sufficiency. It is therefore a diplomacy in motion, in rage, which contrasts strangely with the petrified, motionless world of colonization. And when Mr. Khrushchev brandishes his shoe at the United Nations and hammers the table with it, no colonized individual, no representative of the underdeveloped countries laughs for what Mr. Khrushchev is showing the colonized countries who are watching is that he, the missile-wielding music, is treating these wretched capitalists the way they deserve. Likewise, Castro attending the UN in military uniform does not scandalize the underdeveloped countries. What Castro is demonstrating is how aware he is of the de-Englishing of violence. What is surprising is that he did not enter the UN with his submachine gun, but perhaps they wouldn't have allowed that. The revolts, the acts of desperation, 
factions armed with machetes or axes find their national identities in the unrelenting struggle that pits capitalism against socialism. In 1945, the 45,000 dead at Sadif could go unnoticed. In 1947, the 90,000 dead in Madagascar were written off in a few lines in the press. In 1952, the 200,000 victims of repression in Kenya were met with relative indifference because the international contradictions were not sufficiently clear cut. The Korean War and the war in Indochina had already established a new phase, but it was above all Budapest and Suez which constituted the deciding moments of this confrontation. The three pairs of examples of non uses here illustrates the three phases of struggle that occur as anti colonial movements unfold. Satif and Madagascar represent the suppression of the struggle during the colonial period by the colonists. Korea, not Korea and Vietnam, or Indochina as is written here, represent the civil wars that happened as sub colonized peoples ally themselves with the colonizer against the revolutionary movement, which is why in that first war of Indo for the first war of Indochina, Vietnam gets split up into two halves, right? You have the pro colonialist half and the anti colonialist half. It's more or less. Uh, finally, Budapest and Suez represent the ways that former colonial powers attempt to recapture the newly liberated colonies by clandestine force. Suez uh, was a failed covert, or is referencing a failed covert attempt by the British, French, and Israeli governments to seize control of the Suez Canal and topple uh, the president of Egypt, Nasser, in 1954. That same year, the right-wing factions, right-wing factions in Hungary, used a mass student demonstration as a cover uh, in a failed revolution against the Hungarian go communist government to uh, basically, you know, reinstitute uh, a capitalist state. Um, there's a lot of in, in the description to a book, uh, I believe it's called The Truth About Hungary, uh, where I kind of got some of this information. Also, shout out to Comrade Kilbaner from the VP with Lettuce Discord for turning me on to both the book and kind of giving me like a super brief explanation of that failed revolution in Hungary. Um, it was, I think it was what was once known as a color revolution, much like what we're seeing in, um, in the former Soviet bloc countries right now. Although, I think some of these revolutions, this is totally editorializing, but I think some of those attempts at revolution are, are leg semi-legitimist. Um, but, who knows? Um, let's continue, though. Hardened by the unconditional support of the socialist countries, the colonized to rule themselves with whatever weapons they possess against the impregnable citadel of colonialism. Although the citadel is invincible against knives and bare hands, its invincibility crumbles when we take into account the context of the Cold War. In this new context, the Americans take their role as the parents of international capitalism very seriously. At first, they advised the European countries to decolonize on gentlemen's terms. In a second phase, they have no hesitation first proclaiming their respect, then their support for the principle, Africa for Africans. Today, the U.S. has no qualms officially declaring they are the defenders of the right of peoples to self-determination. The latest voyage by Mr. Menon Williams illustrates all too well the American consciousness that the third world must not be sacrificed. 
understandably, violence is a desperate act only if it is compared in abstracto to the military machine of the oppressors. On the other hand, violence in the context of international relations, we realize, represents a formidable threat to the oppressor. Persistent jackeries and Mau Mau agitation disrupt the economic life of a colony, but pose no threat to the metropolis, a greater threat. As far as imperialism is concerned, is that socialist propaganda might infiltrate the masses and contaminate them. This is back to that earlier footnote I had. It is already serious risk during the conflict's cold period, but what would happen if the colony rotted by bloody guerrilla warfare in the event of a real war? Capitalism then realizes that its military strategy has everything to lose if the national conflicts were to break out. In the framework of peaceful coexistence, therefore, every colony is destined to disappear and taking it to the extreme neutrality command capitalism res capitalism's respect. What must be avoided at all cost are strategic risks. The espousal by the masses of an enemy doctrine and radical hatred by tens of millions of men. The colonized people are perfectly aware of these imperatives which dominate international politics. This is why even those who rage against violence always plan and act on the basis of this global violence. Today, the peaceful coexistence between the two blocks maintains and aggravates the violence in the colonial countries. Perhaps tomorrow we shall see a shift in the violence once the colonial territories have been fully liberated. Perhaps we shall see the issue of minorities raised. Already, some of them have no qualms advocating violent methods in response to their problems, and it is no coincidence that, so we have learned, black radicals in the U.S. have formed armed militia groups. It is no coincidence either that in the so-called free world, there are defense committees for Jewish minorities in the USSR, and that General de Gaulle, in one of his speeches, shed a few tears for the millions of Muslims oppressed by the communist dictatorship. Imperialism and capitalism are convinced that the fight against racism and national liberation movements are purely and simply controlled and masterminded from the outside. Again, what we were talking about earlier, these outside agitators are realistically inner voices actually finally being heard. So they decide to deploy practical tactics such as the creation of Radio Free Europe and committees for the defenses of oppressed minorities. They practice anti-colonialism in the same way the French colonels in Algeria engaged in counterterrorism with the SAS, Sections Administratives Specialis, or psychological warfare. They use the people against the people. We know where that got them. This threatening atmosphere of violence and missiles in no way frightens or disorients the colonized. We have seen that their entire recent history has prepared them to understand the situation between colonial violence and the insidious violence in which the modern world is steeped. There is a kind of complicit correlation a homogeneity. The colonies have adapted to this atmosphere, for once they are in tune with their time. People are sometimes surprised that instead of buying a dress for their wife, the colonies buy a transistor radio. They shouldn't be. The colonized are convinced their fate is in the balance. They live in a doomsday atmosphere and nothing must elude them. This is why they fully understand Fuama and Fuami, Amumba and Shombe, Ahijo and Mwami, Kenyatta and those introduced from time to time to replace him. They fully understand all these men because they are able to unmask the forces behind them. The 
colonized, underdeveloped man is today a political creature in the most global sense of the term. Thank you so much for watching part four of Franz Fanon's Wretched of the Earth. I hope you enjoy it. If you haven't done so already, please give this video a like and hit that subscribe button. If you want to support me in other ways, such as following me on Twitch, joining my Discord, listening to my music, or even giving me some money, check out the links in the description. Also in the description is a link to The Truth About Hungary by Herbert Atflecker. This is where I got the information on the attempted coup in Budapest. Thanks. Bye.